What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to Q&A Monday 13 A's. Don't get it twisted where I'm answering all of your, you know, like four or five of your guys' questions submitted through Discord or Patreon. So, patreon.com slash bdge or Discord channel linked down below. Absolutely free. DM me on there your question at any time throughout the week. As many questions as you want. And if I like the questions or if it goes with the flow of the video, I will include them in there. That is how you submit the questions if you were wondering. If you're wondering what the fuck is going on with my apartment, you probably know about as well as I do. It's an absolute shit show behind me. I, I ordered a bike. I have to put it together myself, so there's a 94% chance that it fucking absolutely falls apart. As I'm riding it for the first time, there's also a 94% chance the table we're building falls apart that Animal's building for Fade the Public. We haven't actually started yet because he needs to bring something called a fucking compressor to the apartment, and this is going to be like a wood workshop upstairs, and uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get sued eventually for running the business in this residential apartment, but that's neither here nor there, and that is not why you are here or there. Y'all are here today to listen to me spew a bunch of bullshit about questions that you submitted. Also, every time I do a video without my glasses on, I, I get a bunch of questions, so I'm just going to address that right now. The glasses I wear are not reading glasses. They are blue light glasses. They emit the blue light that comes from the screens. Y'all gotta understand, I'm staring at screens, whether it's my cell phone, whether it's the monitor, whether it's the laptop or the TV or whatever, like 14 hours a day, and I used to get very, very bad headaches in my eyes would be popping out of my fucking head by the end of the day. So I got these blue light glasses and they had been the best investment I've ever fucking made. This is not a plug. I have no affiliation with Felix Gray, but that is where I got them. FelixGray.com. They have blue light glasses that are actually like normal looking. They help you sleep better. If you get headaches from screens, if you are looking at screens all day, I really, really highly suggest that you guys get a pair of these. I will link them down below the pair that I use. It's the, the Hopper or the Hooper. I don't remember. And sometimes I don't like wearing them because the glare on the screen, if it's during the daytime, the glare is like really bright and then you guys can't really see my fucking eyes and I'd be seducing you with my eyes when I'm talking about certain players, and that's how my channel really works. Y'all don't understand it, but these nonverbal cues is what really pushes the needle. And speaking of pushing the needle, we're about to fucking inject this content into your veins. So without further ado, tuck your shirts in. <clears throat> Stop yelling. Let's eat. Question number one comes in from Big Spence, double O-G, triple O-G from, I just wanted to move my glasses on <laughs> my face, they're not there. From Discord, he says, I have a couple questions, I can see that. Is it possible to intern or apply for a job with BDGE or will it be in the future? If you take a shot on Hayden Hurst, should you partner him with Noah Fant slash Jonu Smith, double down on potential breakout tight ends? Why is your shirt untucked? Is stacking a quarterback with his top target viable and half PPR? Just watched the best ball draft. So I think I'm going to work backwards on this and hit you with some fantasy value off the rip and then go from there. My overarching theme when it comes to stacking players is is that I'm fine with it. No matter the position, running back and wide receiver, quarterback and tight end, tight end and wide receiver, completely fine with it as long as they are on a very good offense. And it makes sense value-wise while you are drafting. For season-long leagues, I definitely don't target teammate stacks in that best ball video that you, you're referring to, which I will link up here. I like to stack in best ball because there have been some analysis done on the fact that stacking in best ball actually gives you a higher percentage chance of winning the overall league or taking money home in your prize. But for season long, I look at it a little bit differently. I, I don't I don't target the stack. I don't avoid them either. The more question marks surrounding the overall offense, the less enticed I am to actually stack those players. I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing that I think a lot of fantasy players and analysts get incorrect when they talk about stacking. They're like, oh, if you get the running back and the wide receiver on the same team, you're limiting the upside. But that's that's not true because if you stack a wide receiver and a running back on the same team or on a good team, right? I'm only supposed I'm only proposing that you stack players if they are on a very good offense. They inadvertently affect each other in a good way or a bad way. But I'm talking about if you stack on a good team, if a wide receiver is having a really good game, that also means that that offense is probably having a good game, which means they're pushing the ball, which means more scoring opportunities, which means more offensive plays overall, which means more opportunities for the running back and vice versa. If a running back is moving the chains, if they're picking up big chunk yardage, that's more passing plays, more passing opportunities, more scoring opportunities overall. So yes, you could say that, oh, not 100, like 100% of the plays are never going to one player anyways. So you just want a good offensive game from an overall team. The whole notion that like stacking limits upside, I think is very closed-minded and is only the case if you're on a poor offense in which I would never stack two players that 
are not on an offense that we project to be, you know, top five, top 10 at worst. However, there's definitely downsides to it, right? Like when I say top 10 at worst, like we all project offenses to take a step up every year, right? Where that's just the fucking public. Everyone gets excited about things and like, oh, this offense is going to be improved, blah, 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 blah. Projecting anything outside of like the top five is very difficult, right? If you project an offense to be like, like the Cleveland Browns going into last year, we're all like, oh, they're going to be like number seven overall, like 17, 27 overall. You know what I mean? Like it's very difficult in the middle spectrum of teams to project how efficiently an offense is going to move. With that in mind, you put yourself at more of an increased risk when you do stack players. If you draft a QB and a wide receiver, right? That's the stack that you choose to go with. If one of them flames out, it is going to affect the other one. If a quarterback doesn't have his top wide receiver target, his play is going to suffer. If a wide receiver doesn't have his quarterback, obviously his play is going to suffer. So now if you stack and one of those two things happen, right? You put double the risk out there because you only need one bad thing to happen to affect two players. And in that sense, it affects basically 20 to 25% of your entire lineup, depending on how many starting players you have in it. I think it depends on what type of league you're playing in, because think about it this way. In a typical fantasy league, you're playing with 12 teams, right? 11 other teams, and you're not playing for second place or third place. You're playing to win the championship, right? You need to be first place. Playing it safe, playing with the floor in mind is never going to win you championships. But stacks, especially quarterbacks and their top receiver or tight end the quarterback wide receiver and the quarterback tight end are probably the ideal type of stack you're going to do in a high powered offense and those are the ones that give you the ceiling on a week-to-week basis and since you're playing against 11 other people like you have a 1 in 12 shot of winning that championship taking out all of the background noise of like how much research and analysis you've done obviously if you're in this community and you're watching this video you probably got like a 1 in 3 chance of winning the chip but hearsay there say everybody fucking take it easy you need to beat 11 other teams when it comes down to it and you can only do that by taking players with upside or taking stacks with very big upside. So there's pros and cons. It's risky, but the upside is there. And given that you need upside to win a championship against 11 other people, sometimes it is absolutely worth it. I'm not necessarily for it. I'm not against it. I don't believe owning two players on the same team limits an individual ceiling because as I said, the the better one player does on an offense, it affects the entire offense as a whole and gives more opportunities over to this other player. And I'll leave you with an example. I I remember uh, maybe three years ago, two years ago, in the E-Town Get Down draft, I took David Johnson, I think like second or third overall. And then we got back to like the fifth round, I want to say. And I was on the clock and it was between Larry Fitz and Mike Evans. And Evans was coming off a down year. Larry Fitzgerald had just put up like whatever, whatever. He was on that hot streak of like 1200 yards for three straight seasons. And everyone's like, oh, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. But the Arizona Cardinals offense was not projected to be one that was high powered, scoring a lot. So it's like, yes, in the individual raw vacuum of it, you like Larry Fitzgerald a lot in the fifth round. He was an extreme value there. He should have been like a third round pick. But I was like, I don't want to stack both David Johnson and Larry Fitzgerald because if that offense goes down the tank, you fucked. So I did fade Fitz, even though I had him ranked higher than Mike Evans, to avoid a shitty offense. I took Mike Evans. He ended up blowing up that year. And and that's a situation in where I would either target or avoid a stack. Okay, so that is question numero one. I do want to touch on a couple other things later this week. I believe tomorrow's video is going to be my wide receiver ranking six through ten. We did one through four last week. Thursday's video, we got Dr. Jesse Morse coming bike onto the show. I don't know if he's actually going to announce it to you guys or not, but he has something really, really cool in the works that's going to benefit a lot of fantasy football players out there. We're talking about exclusive access to some of the top players. I probably already said too much, but he's coming on Thursday. We're probably going to chop that video up into a running back and a wide receiver injury video, you know, guys to avoid and target based on the injuries. And we'll continue on to the other question Big Spence had. If you take a shot on Hayden Hurst, should you partner him with Noah Fant, Jonu Smith, double down on breakout tight ends? So I've absolutely come around to the idea of doubling up on the tight end spot, especially if you miss out on, you know, the upper echelon guys, the Kelsey's, the Mark Andrews, the George Kittles, Noah Fant, Jonu Smith, guys like that. Like if you double down on those guys, you give yourself double the chance of hitting on a tight end. And there's almost nothing worse in fantasy having a solid lineup, but having that hole in the tight end spot where yes, the guy might finish as like the tight end 12 or 13, but he's probably putting you up, you know, seven points here, three and a half points here, four points here, one game of like 11 points that kind of buoys his points per game total, which makes him the tight end 12 which is not what you want in your fantasy lineup. And I'm just thinking back to, you know, I like to use my real life examples to kind of get the point across in in an easy, easily digestible way. I'm thinking back to last year, I played in five money leagues and I made the championship in four of them. And I wanted to see what the common denominator was in those four, right? Two of them, I had Zach Ertz as my starting tight end. One of them, I had Travis Kelsey in as my other starting tight end. And the fourth league, I had Austin Hooper, 
and Vance McDonald. And Vance McDonald was actually the first tight end I took in the eighth round. Austin Hooper was still sitting there in the 10th round, so I doubled up on tight ends. Austin Hooper obviously became the guy and clapped cheeks for me. But I think it speaks to a larger point that if you miss on the upper echelon guys, the lower you get down the tight end rankings, the less likely you are to actually hit on the guy that you think is going to break out. So why not give yourself double the chance? And it's not like a wide receiver or running back where you need to roster extra two or three or four of them on the bench hoping one of them hits. Tight end, you're only starting one of them. So take a second one. It's not like it's eating up your entire bench spot. And you could argue that for quarterback, but that's different because the quarterback position always has so many options available. The tight end, you're starting just one of them in both positions, quarterback and tight end. However, the tight ends don't have a lot on the waiver wire. You're not going to be able to be like, okay, my tight end sucks. My tight end got hurt. Let me just grab one off the waiver wire. Whoever you grab off the waiver wire is going to put up like 2.3 fucking points a game. Quarterback, you can get someone off the waiver wire. We're talking about one quarterback leagues if that puts up like 16 points a game. Rather than trying to look midseason for that tight end, draft two of them, hoping that one of them hits or breaks out. Realistically, I think pairing any of the following makes sense like Hayden Hurst, Jonu Smith, Noah Fan, Ian Thomas, TJ Hawkinson, Mike Kosicki, Austin Hooper even again he can be your double digit late round target he's like going off the board at tight end 13 I think in FFPC drafts Dallas Goddard I mean like goddamn like the tight end landscape does actually feel a little bit deep and there are a lot of guys with upside there are a lot of guys with floor most of them will flop but if you give yourself two of those guys and most of them are going very very late in the double digit rounds you can grab Jonu Smith in the 11th round and then double up Dallas Goddard in the 12th or 13th round one of them breaks out and becomes a top five or six tight end and it was well worth the double investment so I'm very cool doubling down on tight end as for the specific tight ends that I like you're gonna have to grab that in my draft guide it is June 1st so we're officially back to fucking selling season baby I tried all of May not to sell not to push anything to y'all we fucking took a dip in the revenue in order to gain your guys's love the less you sell the more you love but listen we got to feed the kids. Animal, you seen that guy? He fucking eats like a bear. So if you want the tight ends I really like, you're going to have to get that in the draft guide. Our draft guide goes on sale one month from today, July 1st. It has literally everything that you need for your fantasy draft. I mean, I'm talking about rankings one, obviously. PPR, standard, half PPR, the top 200, flex, super flex, fucking flexible. Talk about yoga, hot yoga, cold yoga, fucking goat yoga. Obviously all of our rankings, but we also have our top sleepers, our top busts, our top breakout candidates, our must draft players round by round, favorite resources that help us you know all of the facts that I bring to y'all's faces I show you where to get all of them that is an exclusive article in the draft guide there's obviously our Bible I literally go round by round and position by position it's like an 8,000 word article that I put out every summer the big dogs Bible which last year included telling y'all to fucking draft Lamar Jackson it was like the first thing in the damn Bible easy league winner but this is the best fucking thing you could possibly get for your fantasy football season you can get it in one of two ways. If you are in a state that allows DraftKings or FanDuel, whatever, you can get it through bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKF for literally 10 bucks. You'll not only get the season long, but you'll get the dynasty slash rookie guide as well. If you go to monkeyknifefight.com, you use the promo code BDGE when you sign up for 10 bucks, you will get $10 to play with on there plus $10 bonus money on there. So you're getting 20 bucks plus the two draft guides. So you're getting like a 70 or $80 value legit for 10 bucks. Monkeyknifefight.com, promo code BDGE. Play a game on there of like $2 or more and you will get access to the draft guide. If you're not in a state that has that available to you, just go to bigdogsdraftguide.com. Bigdogsdraftguide.com. It's all there. It's the best resource in the goddamn industry. We work very, 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 very hard on it. Uh, still pre-order pricing. It will come out one month from today, July 1st. June's going to be a very shitty month for me. Not shitty. My head will be in the computer. Don't text. Don't call. Don't at me. Don't leave it. Actually, do leave some YouTube comments and leave some more questions. Getting back to the questions. Big Spence. Why is your shirt untucked? It's not untucked, you cunt. Last question, is it possible to intern or apply for a job with BDGE or will it be in the future? Okay, I actually just did an episode on this, something similar to this topic in my new podcast, Why You Yelling. So go search for Why You Yelling on iTunes or Spotify. The link will also be down below. It's just a quick podcast daily, five to 10 minutes of something on the top of my head. I'm also gonna give out a couple free draft guides. For all you guys that go and listen to Why You Yelling, it's W-H-Y space, the letter U space, yelling. For all you guys that go and listen and leave a review, I will be giving away a couple free draft guides each week for those that 
do leave a review. So I appreciate it. Leave honest reviews too. Let me know how you're actually enjoying it. The first episode went live. Actually, it accidentally went live last week. But today is when it really rips off and we got the entire week already queued up for episodes. So this topic I had touched on, is it possible to intern or apply for a job with BDGE? So we don't have any jobs available. We did an intern search over the last couple months. I opened it up in February or March for applications. I'm assuming this is coming from someone who's new. I get close to five to 10 emails, messages, DMs weekly about people, mostly like college kids wanting to work for big dogs, wanting to intern at big dogs. It's definitely humbling. It's it's really cool to see that, you know, we've built something that people want to be a part of and that they believe in. But there's a couple couple things that come out immediately. They're always like, you know, I watch every one of your videos. You know, do you have any internships available? I'll be like, one, you're lying because you didn't watch all the videos considering, you know, we put out that the internship videos were already closed and we did the whole internship interview, put that out on YouTube and on Instagram and on Twitter and blah, 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 blah. So clearly you didn't watch all the videos. I'm ready to roll when you are, Jack. All right, let's do it. There is a counter in the bottom left corner for the number of times that I will be firing you throughout this interview process. You're at one already because you Gosh. declined my initial Skype call. You're at your girlfriend's place. Yeah, excuse the uh, weird decorations and shit. The weirdest decoration you have in this picture right now is probably your hair. If you were to come here, right, we're obviously limited on space a little bit in the headquarters. I threw my bed into a little room that I can barely fit in. What is your comfort level of sleeping in a place like a bathtub on the floor, on the couch? Yeah, I'd totally be down with sleeping in the couch, on the couch rather. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, thank you. When I was growing up, no problem. I'm not the biggest city guy, which might be a red flag since this is in New York City, but yeah, you're fired. I definitely like to give it a try for months at a little underdressed, but we'll allow it. If selected for this internship, will you be bringing back your mullet? Yes or no? Yes. I want to play a game of truth or dare. Do you know what <sighs> you right. know what truth or dare is? Yeah. Okay. I'm well, familiar. well, you're up because I'm never up. It's it's your turn every time. Let's go for a dare. I dare you to find the closest bottle of alcohol and go vertical on it. Oh, man. Uh, don't have any in the room, but I can grab one go do from downstairs. Thing. I'll keep the people occupied. I'll be right back. See you in a bit. So we got a can of my personal beverage of choice. Rolling Rock right here. Cheers. It's lukewarm, so we'll see how it goes. But Extra style points. You really hear the chug there. Okay, that's enough for me. If you were to come here and get the job, would you be open to a drug test? Yes. If you pass the drug test, you'd be fired. So lie number one, starting off on the wrong foot. Number two, it's always like, I'm super passionate about fantasy football. I'm super passionate about sports. Like, I'd love to be involved. I'll be honest with you. Like, those... I don't, I don't care if, if you're passionate about fantasy football or sports. Like, I'm not, if, if I were to bring you onto the team, it's not for you to like be the guy who does the Monday QA videos from now on. You know what I'm saying? Like, in today's world, and this is, this is going to be the case for most media, most popular media companies going forward into the future. You pretty much, if you want a creative or a unique job in today's world, you have to make it for yourself. The days of sending your application in and having some executive give you the keys to being the face of some sort of content are, are far in the past. You have to, like you, you tell me that you're so creative about, about creating content and about fantasy football and about sports, yet you're not creating content around fantasy football and sports. So you're sending mixed messages there. And as I always say, it's actions speak way louder than words. So if you're someone who thinks you have value to add, you, I don't care that you're telling me that you have value to add. You need to show me. And this is not me being a dick. This is real, this is real life shit. Like think of, uh, think of any, any company, a media company whose brand is extremely strong. Like think of Barstool. Think about the, the people that get popular on Barstool. They make it out of, they, they make themselves out of nothing but some of the the people that have blown up over like the last year like dana beer zillion beers like he made that for himself they weren't like okay dana let's have a meeting about how we can fucking blow you up these things need to come naturally they need to come with a lot of passion they need to come with a lot of natural tendencies if you want a job you have to work like it, it it's already your job you know what i'm saying like i was working full-time on fantasy shit far before it became my full-time job 
Like you work it into existence. And typically the people I add on my team are always gonna be natural fits into the company or the brand. You need to show me that you're a natural fit, not by telling me that you think you're a natural fit, but by literally, you need, you need to be so good that people come to you. And this is just a general piece of advice. Even the companies like ESPN, you know, if you're, if you're obsessed with becoming someone that works at ESPN, do you think people at ESPN in two to three years are gonna give a fuck about you going to college for communications or journalism or video production? Or do they care more about the fact that you have a Twitter following of 8,000 people because you've been giving value out to an audience, you've built your own audience, you understand social media now, and you've done all the things that you're trying to do, right? You're trying to become a content creator, then fucking make content. It's as simple as that. Do it until it's real. That being said, I'm sure we will open up intern applications for next summer when things start to clear up again. It's been a crazy process with everything going on, of course, probably next, you know, March or something. As of right now, we don't have anything opened up. But again, if you're good enough, you'll create that fucking opportunity. You'll catch my eye. You'll catch someone's eye to the point where like, we want to work with you. That's the mindset you gotta have. You can't be like, I wanna work for them. You need to have them be like, I want him to work for me. Question number two. B Dan underscore damn it was good Nick I have keeper questions standard scoring league with two running backs and a flex I can keep Dalvin Cook and lose a second Jacobs for a fourth or Singletary for a 14th so keeper questions are hard to answer from league to league because so much context individual context needs to go into it so the choices basically are standard league Dalvin Cook in the second Josh Jacobs in the fourth Singletary in the 14th so I'll start off immediately by saying that Singletary is <clears throat> without a doubt out of the running I don't care what you think about the value that you're getting from getting him in the 14th round. I want the best players on my team. I want the players with the most upside. I don't care about fucking value. I don't care about real life, keeper, dynasty, whatever. Give me the best fantasy football players that have league winning upside. And Singletary, as much as you like him as a talent, just doesn't have league winning upside this year. I look at the other two, Dalvin Cook in the second, Josh Jacobs in the fourth. Of course, like straight up, you're going to want to take Dalvin Cook in this scenario. But with Jacobs, you're also getting to keep your second round pick. And the other big thing to note here is that it is standard scoring, which of course favors Favors a guy like Josh Jacobs, who's not as involved in the passing game. That's the worry going into 2020. How involved does Jacobs get in the receiving category? So in this scenario where it's standard scoring, it's not that big of a deal. If Jacob stays healthy, I'm very, very confident in saying that he'll end up with more carries and more rushing yards than Dalvin Cook. Total yardage, completely up in the air. I was looking at some sites that had both of them on there. According to points bet, Cook's over under is set at 1,550 yards. Jacobs is at 1,575 yards. Yardage and touchdowns are the only thing that matter in standard scoring. And obviously the Vegas numbers are, are not black and white. That doesn't mean that's what it's going to end up with, but it gives you a, a real real projection of how the market views them, of what realistic expectations are for them. The only separation in standard scoring, again, is touchdowns and yardage. I think what's more important is to look at the combination of players you're going to get in keeper leagues. You have to look at it as you're keeping that second rounder. So it's Jacobs and who? versus Cook and whoever's in the fourth round. So individually, this is where you're gonna need to do a little research. Try to figure out, try to plan ahead of time, look at your, your league's teams, see who you think each player is going to end up keeping and see where that lands you. What kind of players, ooh, she kind of cute. Uh, what kind of players that lands you in the second and fourth round and then do the math that way so you keep Jacobs but you get to keep your second round pick that means do you like a, a pairing like Jacobs and Nick Chubb Jacobs and Julio Jacobs and Tyreek Hill or do you like a pairing like Dalvin Cook and Chris Carson Dalvin Cook and Adam Thielen Dalvin Cook and Quilton Sutton or AJ Brown like that's the way you got to look at keeper leagues right when you're giving up a two round earlier pick as opposed to a fourth round pick or vice versa it's like do you like Josh Jacobs and Julio or Josh Jacobs and Tyree Kill more than Dalvin Cook and Adam Thielen or Dalvin Cook and A.J. Brown. And for me, it's definitely the former. I'm definitely going to go with a guy like Jacobs and you're getting your solid wide receiver one. I'm really a piece of shit. I'm sorry. In that sense, yes, I will I will take the Jacobs side here, but also depends again on what your what your league is keeping. Like if there are if other teams are keeping two players, I'm not really sure what the what the dynamic between it is. But if that rids you of most of the talented players in the first and second round maybe you do just take the high upside player in Dalvin Cook but if you think there's going to be a lot of talented players still available in the first round or in the second round excuse me where you're getting that pick back for Cook then it's probably worth taking Jacobs there question numero Trey Brandon faux show yo Nick love the brand my question for you is when did you first fall in love with fantasy football so I remember first starting fantasy football when maybe I was like 12 or 13 at the time when people were actually like playing outside and shit. I would ride bikes around with my friends like all days. It was during the time where like 
it was before cell phones were a thing. So you would have to like ride to your friend's house and hopefully that person like didn't leave to go meet up with your other friends yet. You'd have to ride to like four or five people's houses, see where all the fucking bikes were posted up at. That's about the time frame. So I want to give you context. I was, I was a very, 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 very young young woman coming into my prime. It was around that time we would bike around all day and we'd end up setting up at our public library in our town, I remember. We would go onto the computers, we would take up all the computers, like me and three or four of my friends. Snacks was probably with me, to be honest. We would go on Yahoo and we would just start draft after draft after draft. We would do public leagues, like 10 public leagues in a day. And I would just, I remember just trying to draft like fucking Priest Holmes over and over and over again. And like all the top players. And I would probably only sit in the fucking mock drafts for like the first round and be like, oh, I got my fucking guy. And then, uh, it just kind of spurted from there. Like that was when I first first started getting into it, and I've been playing ever since. And of course, you know, we've I've been evolving as a as a fantasy player, and and what it means to me. But if I'm being completely honest with you, like I I don't really love fantasy football anymore. I am obsessed with with building things. I'm obsessed with branding and, and marketing and, and building a business. And uh, it's funny, like when I used to play. When I used to play Madden, I don't like playing online. Like I'm a, I'm a very competitive person, but like I never liked playing online. I never liked playing like random games with my favorite teams. My favorite thing in the world was to go on Madden, start a fantasy a fantasy draft, right? With a franchise mode or whatever, and then build my team up, right? And then try to get a bunch of rookies that were like fun to play with and build the offensive line, et cetera, et cetera. I've always been obsessed with building things over the long term, right? And that is translated into what I do today and who I am as a person today. So I've always been really interested in, in the whole side of business that allows me to put those passions in the forefront. And I realize to this day, fantasy football is what allows me to do those other things, right? It's it's a reverse engineering thing. I love building a business. I love marketing. I love branding. I love being right about things. I love being wrong about things and then adjusting from there and innovating and, and being creative. And I understand that fantasy football is what allows me to reach you guys and allows me to build the business around it. So yeah, it's, I, of course, it's still like a passion and a hobby of mine. Like fantasy football will always have a special place in my heart, but I'm, I, I, to say I'm in love with it still, to say I'm anywhere near as passionate about as I was when I was 13, 14, 15 would be a, would be a straight up lie to you guys. And I hope y'all don't take that the wrong way, but it's just the truth. And I will continue to provide the best possible content I can via fantasy football as long as that is the best way for me to build a platform and an audience and a business. Okay, question number four. Do we tend to overvalue rookie running backs in redraft leagues year over year? I think that's a really good question. My initial thought on this is actually to the contrary, that rookie running backs are typically extremely undervalued because when we're in the middle of drafts and you're deciding between a rookie running back and a veteran running back who probably have somewhat similar outlooks, we tend to, or the general public tends to side with the guy that we've seen do it on an NFL field, when in reality, a lot of the times the rookies are primed in a better position or they're more athletic or they're more likely to have a better season, but we fall back on the whole veteran tale. And I wanted to dive a little bit deeper as we always do and see what the numbers actually said. So what I did was go back over the last few years. I did the last four years. I could have done five, but this took like really fucking long to figure out. I made a little chart for y'all. So these were the top five rookie running backs for redraft each year uh, by ADP. So last year, Jacobs was the first running back off the board. David Montgomery, Sanders, Singletary, Henderson in that order in redraft league. So I wanted to look at their ADP and I wanted to look at where they finish to see if we do overvalue or undervalue them. Now, I know this chart is kind of screaming a lot of different colors and information at you. So I'll try to break it down as, as best as I can. For the most part, it does say that we undervalue rookie running backs, probably for the reasons that I laid out in the beginning. I do notice one trend when I looked a little bit harder. When you look at the top tier running backs, the top tier running backs, rookie running backs always tend to be a very, very good investment. So if we start at Josh Jacobs, any running back picked as ADP RB17 or better outproduced or at least matched where they were drafted. Jacobs drafted at RB17, finishes RB15. Saquon in 2018 drafted as RB6, finishes RB2. 2017 was a whole nother fucking story there. You got Kareem Hunt, Christian McCaffrey, Leonard Fournette, Dalvin Cook, all RB11 through 14, all outpaced their numbers. I mean, Christian McCaffrey was about the exact same as his ADP. Dalvin Cook only played a very limited amount of games, but his points per game that year were top 10. And then the year prior to that, Zeke was already drafted as RB3, at least in sharp leagues. He probably went later than that, actually. So the fact that he finishes RB3, I would look at as a positive. So what I'm getting at here is the top end guys, the top end guys that you're a little bit hesitant to draft in round ones and round two and even early round three are probably the guys that are going to outproduce 
what you think they are. As for getting a little bit deeper into them, like yes, Miles Sanders, Devin Singletary, Carry On, Sony, those guys seem to outproduce their ADP, but not in any fashion that helps you win a league, right? They're like value picks just based on the fact that they did finish a little bit higher, but they're not actually propelling your team to any sort of like crazy, crazy upside. So I would say if you're in the beginning of the draft, right, and you have the guys like Clyde over Chalaire who are going in the second round or third round, you're probably getting them at a very good value, and they're probably going to finish above where they're being drafted. Similar to, I mean, look at Kareem Hunt, 2017. I remember as soon as Spencer Ware went down, people were hesitant to draft Kareem Hunt, but he was the Chiefs running back under Andy Reid, and he was the only guy in that backfield. So people were still hesitant. I remember him going around pick like 24 to 28. You can get him in the fucking third round, and he ended up finished as the RB5. I think that's like a very similar scenario to what we're to what we might see from like a Clyde Edwards Hilaire this year. Though people have smartened up and like Clyde is arguably a back end first, early second round pick. The overall gist of things that we tend to undervalue the really, really hyped up rookies. And they usually, even if drafted highly, outproduce where they're drafted. All right. So I just kind of screenshotted a plethora of Patreon questions that I'm going to rip through real quick as the end of the segment comes to us if you are enjoying make sure you hit that thumbs up button it would be greatly appreciated and subscribe to the channel if you are new if you want more fantasy football advice throughout the summer georgie uncle george would you rather be one of the top five biggest movie actors in the world or one of the top five best nfl players today he follows up hollywood doesn't drug test as a reminder this should be easy i didn't need that reminder to let me know what i was going to choose there i'll i'll I'm, without question i'm choosing to be a top five biggest movie actor in today's world i mean fuck i'll i'll be an actor and play a top five quarterback in a movie and then be more famous than that actual player in real life. I'll be the next fucking Willie Beeman. You call me Nicky Beeman from now on. Nicky Beeman. So that's easy. I mean, actors are, are worldwide phenoms. They can get anything they want at any time. The opportunities are endless. You're never in season. So you don't have like a six month period where you need to be solely focused on staring at TVs, watching film, keeping your body in shape, not going out and partying and, and drinking and doing whatever the fuck you want. So acting easy. Trey, when doing a dynasty startup or trading in a dynasty league, how much should we take into consideration the team's future potential draft picks? Example, trading for scary motherfucking Terry in hopes of them getting Lawrence or Fields. Okay, so the example I like to use is this. Daily Fantasy Sports, very popular game. 98% of people that play DFS lose. The point there being we can't predict. You make your fantasy lineup like the day of. We can't predict something that's going to happen that day. We get tons of shit wrong in season long. We can't predict something that's happening the day of. We can't predict something that's happening in a season long league, let alone two to three years down the road. Especially in a situation like the example you gave. High end quarterbacks are always number one picks off the board. Number two, number three, number four. So that team, like not, you're projecting so many things. One, you're projecting that these will still be top prospects. Two, you're projecting that the Redskins, what if what if Dwayne Haskins is is like a competent quarterback? What if he leads them to a six and 10 record this year? Even if they want to get rid of Dwayne Haskins after that, a six and 10 record is not going to get you the number one or number two overall pick, which is what's going to require of an NFL team to get Trevor Lawrence or to get Fields. So you're projecting too much into that. And yes, of course, you always Always look at the long-term ramifications when it comes to dynasty, but look at more tangible things. Look at contracts, the depth chart behind a certain player. Look at the targets available. Don't look at things that you think might happen two or three years down the road because we as a society are fucking miserable at predicting things. Teams that try to tank can't tank like there's no tanking in the nfl i'm sorry you could just be a very bad you're you're predicting a team to tank correctly you're predicting the prospects to still be good you're predicting them now to be drafted and develop extremely quickly into really good nfl players if there's just too many moving parts for me to look that far into the future sorry trey it was nothing personal i just had to yell about it Make sure you're listening to the Why You Yelling podcast. Link down below. Nick Haas, if you could only have one drink that's not a marg for the rest of your life, what are you drinking? Oh, boy. One of my favorite quotes in the world is, the perfect day is 10 hours of caffeine and four hours of alcohol. That's how I try to live my life. If there was a symbolic way of putting my life into a quote, that's it. If you're talking about non-alcohol related, just just fucking caffeine into my veins all day coffee if we're talking about al alcohol big fan of moscow mules especially the fact that they come with they usually come in really fucking cool cups big moscow mule guy i'll never really admit that though because i have to stay on brand with the marks on the flesh in the heart marks don't ask me questions like that again cody running your own brand what to you is the biggest struggle personally keeping the brand afloat it's cliche but like i'm, I'm my own worst enemy i think that like 
there's usually so much being able to keep yourself in a good headspace is very very difficult especially in a, in a social world like today where what i'm building is so interactive and engaging and i'm someone that feels terrible like you gotta understand the first two three years that i was doing this stuff i answered every email every comment every twitter engagement like personally right and uh i'm obviously at the point now where that's extremely difficult to do day in and day out without being able to get the important shit done that moves the business forward um and i tweeted this out yesterday like the number of the number of platforms in which i communicate with people even like my friends, like I'll have conversations with Steve that somehow spread from Facebook Messenger to Snapchat to iMessage to a FaceTime back to Twitter DMs, like legit one conversation that goes through six different social media platforms. So I'm talking about Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, both personal and brand for both Twitter and Instagram, Discord channel, Slack with my team, text messaging between group chats of, of Noah and Mike and, and Snacks and Animal, and obviously trying to keep my social life afloat with my friends and, and dating girls and keeping in touch with my family and like 13 other ways of communicating. I have like four emails, the YouTube comments. This is not, I'm not like looking for sympathy or empathy, but this is the most difficult thing for me is because I always have this underlying anxiety that I like, that I miss something, right? If I remember I got a link LinkedIn message like two days ago, I might just remember 48 hours later and I'm like, oh fuck, I have to get back to do that. There's just a lot like staying organized and staying on top of, of shit while you just feel like you have so much going on all the time is, is difficult. So it, it's staying grounded. It's, it's, it's finding, it's figuring out things that relieve stress in your life. You know, it depends what that is for you. For me, I, I go out and, and take walks as much as I can. I go hang out at the park by myself when, it, when it's really nice out, uh, working out, relieve stress a lot for me so yeah I, I would say that's that's definitely the most difficult thing for keeping a brand afloat is just uh staying on top of your mental health and last question of the day michael chiara Chia? have you read anything good lately uh despite the books back there and all the books on my desk i don't read i don't read i think i've fucking lost the capability to read to be honest with you i can't i've got no focus whatsoever anymore when i try to read all these books i buy I read like 20 pages and I'm like, fuck this. I'm out. I'm out, man. You're cool. You're cool. You're cool. But I'm fucking out. I just don't consume content through reading. It's just not the way I, pr I prefer to consume my information. I listen to podcasts literally like 24 seven. Like as soon as I stop filming this and editing it, there's going to be a podcast on the infamous boomstick. I wish I read more. But it's just not something I, I think in today's world, like I try to be as efficient as I can and I could listen to podcasts while I'm working out or going for a walk so I can knock out multiple birds with one fucking big ass stick, the boom stick. And I think that's okay. Like I, that's just me being self-aware. I understand that I can't read. So I stopped trying to force it. Like I had a period where every six months I'd be like, okay, I'm making a promise to myself every day. I'm going to wake up and read 20 pages. That shit failed after like two days. Maybe if I stuck with it, it would start working more, but I love podcasts. I love listening to them. It's funny because like you guys watch me on YouTube. I would never, ever, ever in a million years watch someone on YouTube talk about fantasy football. I'm glad you guys do, of course, because it's my fucking livelihood. But me personally, that's just not how I consume it. I do watch other, like I'm, I'm subscribed to other YouTube channels and shit, but not via, not for fantasy football. It'll be for like, you know, like tech reviews or like health and fitness stuff. But for the most part, yeah, I just, I just, I just don't. Don't, don't, don't read, but make sure that you guys keep listening and keep watching me because shit will not be good for business if you do stop. If I could leave you with a few things, a few reminders, again, everything I bring up will be linked in the description and I usually pin them in the comment section as soon as I wake up of whatever day the video comes out. Make sure y'all go cop the draft guide, man. We work very, very, very hard on it and I truly think it's the most valuable piece of paid content that you could find in the fantasy football industry. So bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKF. Otherwise, bigdogdraftguide.com for you normal folks out there. Go subscribe and leave a review for the Why You Yelling podcast, please. It would it would actually mean a lot to me because I'm kind of putting my heart and my soul on the track like Shoes did. Leave a comment if you know what song that's from. And that's it, man. Hit the thumbs up. If you want to leave a question for next week's Q&A, DM me on Discord or join Patreon and hit that thread. I love y'all. I'm out. Have a good week, baby.